All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome and thank you very much for being here with us tonight at Movies with the Meadows. We are lucky this evening to be joined by Dr. Constantine Eclanu, who is a lecturer of Spanish and the first year Spanish language coordinator here at Southern Methodist University. He obtained his PhD from the University of Kentucky in 2017 with a specialization in the representation of immigrant discourses in the Spanish media. His dissertation focused on immigrant voices in political speech, music and film, and their efficacy in garnering empathy for their cause. He recently completed the translation of Isaac Rosa's Rascos Occidentales short story and published a chapter on graphic novel novels and post-Spanish Civil War violence entitled Espectros de Poder in 2020. Dr. Eclanu also specializes in Spanish film about immigration and social issues and enjoys bringing all these new topics to the students at SMU. So I will now turn it over to him. And again, thank you for joining us, particularly our students who are studying for finals this week. All right, welcome everybody to uh, today's presentation with uh, Movies with the Meadows. Um, and I wanted to thank first and foremost um, the Meadows Museum for putting uh, this program together and for inviting me to present uh, on this very special topic. Uh, thank you to Anne Kinseth and um, for uh, conceiving this film series and for Nancy Israel for moderating and introducing me this evening. Um, what I have planned for you today is entitled The Power of Films to Change Law and an ethical dilemma. So where does one uh, begin when uh, starting a story that ends with death? In the end, it is uh, not any different than any other story, with the exception that uh, unlike most stories and films where the protagonists do all they can to avoid uh, murderous psychopaths uh, in horror films, whizzing bullets in uh, war or action films, uh, or indiscriminate killings by aliens in science fiction films, in Mar Adentro, our protagonist seeks death. Thus, as viewers, we are faced with what can be called a reverse plot, where one faces similar challenges, difficulties, and finally joy and reprieve from the troubles that assail our main character in the end, only that it's all done not to avoid death, but to seek uh, death. We empathetically engage with Ramon San Pedro and wish um, that he is granted his petition, but also face an extra diegetic, meaning not pertaining to the narrative, concern of what is right. Uh, as such, in this presentation, I will attempt to show two things. One, that despite our innate will to live, we cannot extrapolate that life in all circumstances is worth continuing if it goes against the wishes of a reasoning individual. And second, that films are a powerful medium to affect social change in changing ways on, uh, in challenging ways on topics not immediately apparent uh, to us. So first and foremost, who is Ramon San Pedro and is Mar Adentro a film of fiction? Mar Adentro is very much based on real events. Uh, like any other film though, it has a script and uses artifice to draw the viewers in. However, the basics of the plot are very realistic and they conform to the actual history of Ramon San Pedro. All right, so who is Ramon San Pedro? Uh, the story is based on the actual life of Ramon San Pedro Camean, uh, who was a Galician. Uh, Galicia is a region north of uh, Spain. Let me show you. Um, <clears throat> uh, this part right here, so this is Spain, and the northern part, uh, northern western part of Spain is Galicia. And I have also highlighted the two cities where the action takes place. Uh, one is A Coruña and the other one is Boiro, and you can see the distance on the map. Um, okay, <clears throat> uh, he is a sailor. That is what uh, he did. He was born in 1943 on the 5th of January in a small province uh, of A Coruña, and that's the map. At 22 years old, 
uh, he embarked on a Norwegian freight ship where he worked as a mechanic. Uh, with the ship, he traveled the world and made port in 49 distinct places, learning to love the voyage and what makes the world different and vibrant in all these places. On the 23rd of August of 1968, he fell in the water from a rock. Uh, and this one in the film, it is made that he jumps and it's done on purpose. Uh, in his own history, it is unclear whether he intended to jump or whether he simply fell. Uh, as the tide had gone, right, it had retreated, uh, he hit his head on the sand, which caused a fracture in the seventh uh, cervical uh, vertebrae, right, so of the neck. For the next 30 years, 29 to 30 years, um, he has desired to die with dignity, and his case even was taken all the way to the Tribunal of Human Rights in Strasbourg. However, it availed him nothing. <laughs> While uh, imprisoned in his bed for a period of about 29, 30 years, he read voraciously and even started writing um, with a contraption he designed himself. Using a pen held in his mouth, he wrote two books. Uh, one of poetry, Cuando Eu Caía, and you can see the pictures at the bottom, which is When I Fall, and Cartas Desde el Infierno, which is Letters from Hell. Many of his TV appearances, uh, after going public and seeking a change in the law, have brought him a certain amount of fame. And despite his quadriplegic condition, um, it, it made him quite popular with the ladies. Uh, in the preface um, of the script for Mar Adentro, Mateo Gil, which is one of the writers of the film, recount, recounts what Ramon wrote in one of his letters from hell about his thoughts on the day of his fall as related to his relationship with women. The reason why I'm including these is to give you some context of what kind of a lively person he was uh, and a little bit about his personality. You may like what you hear or you may dislike what you hear. However, this is the real person. And as real people, uh, none of us are totally likable or hopefully not totally dislikable, right? We have both of, you know, some of the characteristics of both. Okay, so in one of his letters, he recounts, um, he had been invited to have dinner uh, with the parents of a girl who professed to love him uh, and offered uh, him marriage after the accident. Right? So he breaks his neck, and while he's recovering, she comes and she says, I still want to marry you, I'm ready, and he uh, shoes her away. And then he, he remembers that that evening on that faithful rock uh, from where he fell, uh, young Ramon compared this love full of formality and honesty with the lighting, lightning, fast, and careless experience on the coast of Brazil when he was on that ship traveling the world. And he says that they felt crazy, free, and without any moral prejudice. Okay, so this is key in thinking about him as an individual, as an individual that is crazy, free, and without moral prejudice. And this is how he's going to go about um, addressing the lawsuits and in how he tries to change the law. He says, in reality, uh, he confesses in the same letter, and I quote, I wondered if I should not show up for the engagement dinner, uh, <laughs> not see my future wife, uh, and drop the chains that would tie me down and run off to Brazil where the whores are duty free. <laughs> right? It's offensive, right? But you can imagine what person this was and what kind of life he had to then not be able to move anything but his, just barely his neck and his lips. Mateo Hill, the, right, the writer of, uh, uh, one of the writers of the, of the film Mara Dentro that you have watched, uh, mentions that this letter contextualizes, and I quote, contextualizes very well the essential conflict with Ramon San Pedro. His conflict is that despite his condition, he was not dejected, depressed, nor without purpose. He is in fact very willful, um, and he was involved with determination in pursuing his own death, right? So unlike people that you would think would want uh, to end their lives, which are either depressed or in a mental state that is unfit, 
that was not the case of Ramon at all, which in some ways makes his case more potent. And in others, it feels like, well, there are people way worse than you and they're not asking for death. Why do you, right? So it's, it's a, it's a two, two-edged knife, uh, his, his position. Uh, and I'll continue more with his um, love life a little bit, um, a, comparing it to his unwillingness to be in a wheelchair and why that is. Uh, Ramon was also known to be very stubborn and not accept a wheelchair that would give him some form of mobility and autonomy, but not fully, right? He recalls, and I quote, accepting the wheelchair is to accept a miserable freedom. Like his love, love life after the accident, the man uh, that who, who had loved so intensely now chose to love no one. And not only because he could not touch, hold, or make love to a woman again, but because any semblance of love would have to be incomplete, a simple shadow of what love could be. And again, not because there are not no other forms of love that do not involve sex, but rather because people have a choice how to live normally, right? His, <clears throat> his uh, on the other hand, it only is one option. Right? To truly love, one has to be free. Free uh, like he was the day on the rock, being able to choose between a formal dinner and the prostitutes in Brazil. Right? He's free to choose and able to do it. Right? So if he wants to have just a simple friendship uh, with a woman, he can. Uh, if he wants to have a romantic relationship with a woman, and obviously it's consensual, he can. However, right, he has multiple options, but when he is in his position, there are no multiple options. There's only one option, which is to be in a bed and barely be able to move your head. While in his bed prison, many women came to visit him, became friends, and some even fell in love with him. He rejected all of them in the end. Could, what, could, could one call him cruel? Probably, but more possibly, this was the only way to assert some form of freedom and choice in his forced condition. Ramon Das is a very complex individual that seems not to suffer beyond any purpose in life in order to wish his death. Instead, he seems clear-minded, full of life, and inspirational in the poetry and the book that he wrote. Albeit sometimes he is cr crude, and um, possibly interpreted as cruel at times. Um, next, I want to talk about uh, the law in Spain and how the law conforms with um, assisted suicide, which is what uh, he's requiring. So this brings us to the most important question that arises from the film. Should society provide him with the tools necessary for his suicide? Suicide obviously is not prohibited by law, but assisted suicide is. In the Spanish Penal Code of 1995, uh, in the article 143, uh, we read the prohibitions of anyone uh, from assisting people to commit suicide. And I'll read the four points. Number one, the person that induces suicide in another will be punished by the law with a prison sentence of four to eight years. Okay, so that's the normal uh, prison time if anybody helps somebody commit suicide. Uh, point number two, a prison sentence of two to five years will be required to a person that uh, cooperates with the ne necessary acts of another suicide. Number three, a person will be punished with a prison sentence between six to 10 years if the cooperation gets to the point of executing the death. And number four and last, the person that causes or cooperates actively with the necessary and direct acts of death of another person with the express and serious unequivocal, unequivocal uh, petition of the sufferer of an incurable disease that will lead to their death or that will lead to permanent suffering difficult to endure will be punished with a penalty uh, of one um, or two degrees less than what is prescribed in points number two and three of the above articles. Okay, so the law before this point 
um, uh, recognize that there are some cases where assisting somebody um, to die, let's say in a hospital bed, um, a person that is suffering tremendously and is about to die anyway, that helping that process go further is more acceptable than not. Um, and that's why the punishment is reduced uh, from the previous sentences, but there's still a punishment. So it's still illegal to help anybody. So clearly the law prohibits people from helping others commit suicide and any that do will be punished with prison sentences. Um, and I want to quote here from Maria Jose Guerrera. He explains, and I quote, in order to achieve this, right, his death, uh, as a disabled person, he needed some help, not uh, conscious uh, or, or determination, as he explicitly said, but only the legs and arms of others. These he needed temporarily to borrow, right? His struggle was therefore in the cause of autonomy for disabled people. In sum, and I quote, the legal fight of San Pedro has not finished. One of his wishes was to follow the legal process. He expressed this wish to send uh, his legal case to the International Court, uh, court uh, at The Hague. His view uh, was that the Spanish legal system had violated his rights as a citizen and had denied uh, him the dignity of a person that is affirmed in the Spanish Constitution and in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. That is, his legal request was one of discrimination or an anti-discrimination because his basic rights as a of a human being were denied, right? Other people with full use of their limbs could plan, get the materials, and in the end, end their lives because they could, right? But due to his paralysis, he could not, right? So the case is not so much everybody who wants to can um, be helped to commit suicide, but rather people in desperate situations who are clear-minded and who want this and who find use for it, but they themselves cannot achieve this, then those people should be helped, right? So he's saying, uh, like we put ramps and things on stairs to help uh, disabled people, the same way he is disabled and he wants to do something, and whatever he wants to do, it's not our business, right? It is his own business what he wants to do with his body and his life um, as it affects uh, him, but because he can't, right, we should provide those means, just like those ramps, right, uh, for disabled people. So as Ramon San Pedro's legal challenges to the law uh, to save those that would help him die uh, from being put in prison failed, uh, with the help of his friends, uh, he accomplished his assisted suicide on May 12th of January 1998 uh, in Boiro, and that's why I put on the map the other town, also in Galicia. Uh, Ramon is asked, uh, asked each person willing to assist him to only do a small part of the tasks to, tasks to assist in his suicide so that no one person could be charged. Okay, so one person uh, purchased the potassium cyanide poison. Another tested the substance uh, to select the right dose. Another prepared the drink. Another brought the drink. Another person set up the camera to record, uh, and then all of them left the apartment so only Ramon could incline his head, drink of the poison, and die according to his desires. His closest associate, Ramona Maneiro, um, after his death was arrested uh, and charged with assisted suicide. However, due to the lack of evidence, uh, she was released. Um, in the trials, uh, she uh, talks about uh, her relationship with Ramon, but never admits um, to, his, uh, to her helping him directly, right, of the fear of the law. Now, when she is released, she pretty much confesses on TV that she was the one that uh, you know, facilitated his death. And the, the, the political, different political parties in Spain tried to reopen the, the trial uh, and get her convicted, but nobody had uh, any desire for that because the public opinion, about 76% of the people in Spain agreed with um, Ramon 
uh, and believed that his case was just, and thus nobody had the appetite to uh, condemn her. So all this happened in 1998, okay? We are in um, 2021, so some time has passed um, in, in Spain from this, from this point. And I'm going to change this. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk a little bit more about the representations of Ramon San Pedro in other films uh, and other um, situations, and also about Alejandro Amenabar, uh, the director of the film Mar Adentro. Uh, in 2001, um, we get the, the film that is made for TV uh, called Condenado a Vivir, which is Condemned to Life. And this is a TV film directed by uh, Roberto Bodegas, and he comes out advocating for the rights uh, to death with dignity uh, as related to the life and death of Ramon San Pedro. Three years later, the topic is again picked up, this time by a much more famous director. And this is Alejandro Amenabar, uh, who is known for Tesis. This is his first film in 1996. Uh, Ab Abre los Ojos in 1997 and The Others, uh, which is a film that was very popular uh, here in America as well. Um, and The Others came out in 2001. In 2004, uh, the film Mar Adentro um, comes out and it reignites the question of death with dignity and euthanasia um, in the media and, and again in the law. And the legal efforts to change the law and make Spain one of the first countries to legalize euthanasia uh, in special cases continue to be blocked until very recently. In fact, less than two months ago, on March 18th, um, 2021, the Spanish parliament voted uh, to legalize euthanasia, become, becoming one of the very few states uh, to allow it. Um, the law uh, has been amended as follows, and I will read um, the new uh, Article 5 and 4. So 4 has been changed from what it sounded before. 1, 2, and 3 stay the same uh, as the laws, like uh, as you saw here. So 1, 2, and 3 stays, stay the same. 4 is uh, changed, and there's added a new uh, fifth um, section, and I'll read number 4. The person that causes or cooperates, so this is new on um, March 18th of this year. The person that causes or cooperates actively with the necessary and direct acts of death of another person that suffers a serious ailment, chronic or prohibiting, or an incurable serious disease that causes constant and unbearable physical or mental suffering, and with the express and serious unequivocal petition of the sufferer, will be punished with a penalty one or two degrees less than what is prescribed in uh, section two and three of the above articles. And number five, and this is where it all changes. However, despite the required, the requirements in the previous sections, a person shall not incur any penal responsibility if they cause or actively cooperate in the death of another fulfilling proceedings established in the organic um, regulating law of euthanasia. So besides changing the penal code, um, the Spanish uh, parliament also put into law what is called the law of euthanasia. And this prescribes, uh, it is fairly complex, uh, but it prescribes the means uh, that people suffering certain kinds of diseases um, or incurable or at the point of death or not even, they just need um, to be assisted in suicide, can uh, ask for it. Uh, the euthanasia law is very um, careful um, to acknowledge um, other people's wishes. Um, and if a person desires, like Ramon San Pedro, to die, they would have to make a petition. They would have to be seen by um, doctors, they would have to be let known uh, the exact proceedings, what the poisons would do, how he would feel. So he's given a talk in a way, right? To, in a way, not necessarily dissuade him, but to fully understand. The person is also seen by a psychiatrist 
to make sure that they are in full capacity of uh, their faculties. And then they make a petition uh, into which the person asks for that. This petition is then the person has to wait uh, a certain period between two weeks and two months. Uh, and the person is given time to withdraw their petition. After this period of time, after these two to two months period, they have to make a new petition saying, I have not changed my mind. I still want uh, to be assisted in my suicide. And once that is reviewed again, um, the person is allowed to do so. Uh, it also allows for the doctors that will perform this uh, procedure to withdraw themselves if um, they feel that they are not willing to administer uh, these medications. Um, so in that way, the conscience of the doctor, be it religious concerns or ethical concerns, is taken into account. So nobody is uh, forced to do this. But that is the, the law of euthanasia as it is implemented today since um, just less than two months ago. Um, now, in the news reports coming from the proceedings um, uh, of the case of Ramon San Pedro and specifically the film that you have just watched, or I hope you will watch if you haven't, um, these were cited as sources that, uh, that were influential in making these decisions. This goes to show how films um, socially committed can change the law um, and afford more justice for people oppressed in ways that may not seem immediately apparent or obvious. To show the power of the media in making the case to change laws, uh, Andrew Butler, this is an academic, uh, academic uh, ran an experiment to evaluate the use of popular film in order to enhance classroom, classroom learning. His findings are so interesting, specifically related to the power of films in changing perspectives. Now, this obviously, again, is a, is a double-edged sword, right? Because you can change perspective towards something that is maybe meaningful and gives more rights or maybe the other way, right? So one should always be critical uh, in um, judging what is being put forth by a film and what ideologies are portrayed and what those possible effects can be despite the empathetic reaction that we have while seeing the film, right? And this is what um, uh, Professor Butler says. He says, retention and accuracy of the information presented in textual and filmic uh, texts are the most important factors in their study. Uh, Butler and the other uh, co-writers show that film is exceptionally influential in terms of recall, even when it presents information that contradicts previously taught material. Meaning the professor teaches a text and then they show a film that is a little bit different. The students will remember the film, not the text. Uh, furthermore, even when students are warned with a non-specific caution that the film may present factually incorrect material, students remember the information in the film and later incorrectly blamed texts for supplying them with the erroneous information. This is exactly the opposite. The texts were correct. And this is what Butler writes, and I quote, however, when the information in the film contradicted the text, Subjects often falsely recalled the misinformation from the film. This misinformation effect occurred when no warning or a general warning was given prior to the presentation of the film clip. Moreover, the misinformation effects uh, obtained were quite large. Approximately, approximately half of all respondents to the text film inconsistent questions consisted uh, of misinformation in some conditions. In addition, subjects were highly confident in their accuracy, which is amazing, right? Uh, of the misinformation they produced and sometimes misattributed it to the text when asked uh, to make a source uh, judgment. The results show that films and texts and fil film and text combinations are extremely powerful in um, uh, retaining and recalling information, even if at times these combinations are extremely powerful um, in retaining it, um, it to show uh, how films have a great influence over the viewers. And if the films 
are not necessarily accompanied by specific information that refutes false claims presented in the films, most viewers will accept misleading information. Right, so that's that double-edged sword uh, of cinema, right? Um, some of you that are in my classes, we've seen the film Beautiful, where we see this uh, Spaniard uh, who lives a fairly impoverished life, uh, and he's a father, and his wife is a mess, and he's trying to provide best for his children. And his job as a human trafficker is obviously wrong, yet we build such empathy to him as a father and a provider that we're seriously closing our eyes to the insanity that he causes uh, due to his actions. Anyway, so um, the goal here is to understand the film is very powerful that way in creating feelings in people and then, um, right, we have to be critical about those. Okay, so uh, highlighting the power of the media to shape the viewer perceptions and even inspire lawmakers uh, to bring about legal reform, we have, I, I wanted to present two uh, specific uh, cases or films, uh, one in Spain and one in France. These are fairly rare, and that's why I want to include them because they are exceptional. And now they are joined by Mar Adentro as another one of these uh, sources where a film and a campaign and all these other people have made it to change the law. So the first one is called the Orantes case in Spain. Uh, and the second is the film uh, Indigens. Uh, that's translated to Days of Glory um, in France. So in 1997, and this is the Orantes case, um, a, a situation brought to the forefront of the Spanish population that gendered violence continued mostly unchallenged in Spain, even after Franco's death. So um, Spain uh, lived through this Franco regime, which is a um, fascist dictatorship. Uh, and in, these, in this time, um, and I quote during the, the Franco regime, and I quote, Francoist courts recognize the jealousy and honor as extenuating circumstances, thus excluding the death penalty for men. And prior to 1958, men were legally permitted are you ready for this? To kill their wives or daughters if they caught them in the act of adultery, right? So um, what, what the Orantes case is about is about uh, this uh, lady, her name was Ana Orantes, who was so mistreated and so abused by her husband, and she had absolutely no legal recourse to turn him in, to do anything, because he was immune um, by the law. And this is what Duncan Wheeler explains uh, how the reform started. Uh, a major paradigm shift occurred in December 1997 with the death of Ana Orantes. After recounting the ill treatment um, she had received throughout her 40-year marriage on a television talk show, she was doused in gasoline and burnt alive by her husband. The media frenzy focused not only on the brutality of Ana's death, but also on the inadequacy of the legal system to protect her. Now, this uh, is obviously insane, right? But um, at times, it's the acts that happen, right? The husband um, murdering this, this woman, but also not just the action, but the way it's represented. That representation is what causes people to change their minds on things, right? Murders and crime happens all the time, and we don't change law just because of it. But we do change law when that representation becomes potent, right? And weaponized in a way by the media to help us understand the situation differently. So beginning with the media's attention of Ana's killings by her husband and the victory of the Partido Socialista Obrero Español, which is the uh, Spanish Social Socialist Party, the 2004 Ley Integral contra la Violencia de Género, which is Comprehensive Law Against the Gender Violence, was adopted. This law makes Spain one of the most progressive states in Europe regarding its legislation against domestic violence. Wheeler concludes that the Orantes case in films like, and these are films that are based on this Orantes case, which is Solas or Alone, Sola, Solo Mia, or Mine Alone, another film, and Te Doy Mis Ojos, Take My Eyes, 
have aided in creating an atmosphere where violence against women is unacceptable and thus had, uh, they, they played their part in passing of the law against gender violence in Spain. This example goes to show that when social issues become the focus of the people's outrage throughout the media and with the media's attention, they can have a far reaching influence on the culture and law in Spain and really anywhere. Another example is uh, that can change a country's outlook on irregularities and social issues is presented in the 2006 film Indigens or Days of Glory. Uh, this film reminded the French government of the indecency of paying lower pensions to the Algerian troops that helped liberate Paris from the Nazis um, when compared to pensions of French born citizens who fought in the same war. Right, so these are these Algerians, right, come from Africa and kick out the Nazis, and then they make a life uh, in Spain, right? They immigrate, uh, sorry, not to Spain, to France. They immigrate to France and they, they continue living there. They get a pension for war, but because they're not French born, their pension is much reduced than the French born citizens who fought in the same war. Um, this film, the specific film, Indigens, um, was uh, um, an appealing form uh, from a humane standpoint and used an empathetic strategy to affect the law in a similar fashion to the Orantes case and the film Take My Eyes uh, in Spain. And um, uh, Alec Hargreaves recounts, Indigens capitalized upon and helped to influence major public debates within France about the nation's colonial past, right? Algeria is a colony, an old colony of France, and contemporary post-colonial immigrant minorities. In highlighting the role played by North African colonial troops in the liberation of France during World War II, the movie helped to persuade President Chirac to end the long-standing injustice whereby veterans in former colonies have been receiving lower pensions than their former comrades in arms in France. The promotion of indigens was also used to press the case for fair treatment of African immigrant minorities in contemporary France. While probably indigens um, was not the only culprit right, in changing the law in France, as neither was the film Take My Eyes nor uh, Mar Adentro, its role in bringing to the forefront um, the unjust treatment of North Africans in France or gendered violence in Spain or um, death with dignity again in Spain is invaluable. Consequently, the law was changed and this example shows the power narratives and especially films have been challenging injustice and making people's lives better. It is fascinating to see how Ramon San Pedro um, or, let me spell it out for you, his last name, San Pedro, comes from San Pedro, which means Saint Peter, or the apostle who holds the keys to the entry into heaven, has become the catalyst to change and the means of opening the door, right, the keys of Saint Peter, to all those who seek a dignified death, yet who find it impossible to achieve without assistance. Is euthanasia to be made legal everywhere? I think a better question is, do we respect people as agents of their own free will? Beyond religious questions and the Hippocratic Oath, listening and accepting difference shows not our weakness, but our strength and respect for humanity that sprouts in many different forms often immediately recognizable and at times in surprising ways like we see in Mar Adentro. I would like to end my presentation with a poem uh, that bears the namesake of Ramon's book, When I Fall. And here it is. Those are the posters for Indigens and Te Doy Mis Ojos, those other films that have helped change uh, Spanish law. Um, and I have made a translation uh, of this poem uh, for you guys. So let me uh, read it to you and then uh, we will end. He says, when I fall like a ripe fruit on off the tree of life, leave me there where I fall, 
So the sun, the wind, and the moon hug me, that life devour me bit by bit. That everyone be able to gather the love that they gave me, the light, its light, the water, its water, the land, its ash, his spirit, the wind. Let everyone pick that part that they need of me. Don't let me be hidden by human greed in the prison cell of the dead, in a sacred cage clinging to a memory, crying like a child that does not want to return that which was lent him, his life. From the seed to the fruit, I was pushed along by love. When it returns to its origin, knocked down or bent over, friend or foe, let it not cause you fright. Even when it seems to you that I no longer am alive, it is not that I am dead, instead that I am being reborn. Do not cover me with the earth, nor put me in a niche, if you do not want to see me, take me to an open field. Leave me looking at the sky so that I scatter in pieces, belonging to all that want to take something of me. A worm, a fly, a bird, until they consume me in behalf, in behalf of a loaned love in order to push life forth, dreaming but free, that each take back what they loaned me. So when I fall, all of you, leave me on the spot so I can return to life in the same place where I may fall. Thank you all for coming to this presentation. Uh, and I hope that you have found it uh, interesting and, and valuable. Uh, and I wanted to thank again the, the Meadows Museum and uh, Nancy Israel for hosting. Uh, we have some time. Uh, for questions and discussion uh, on the topic. So if you have questions, please put them uh, into the chat and I will do my best to answer. Thank you so much, Constantine. That was fascinating, truly. Um, there was a question early on from Lynn asking if anyone has availed themselves of the laws, of the new law. What, what does that mean? Has anybody availed themselves? It is, let me just ask her. Is that, has anybody? uh petition the government to have euthanasia yes uh well so uh, there have been other cases uh ramon san pedro is not the only one there are uh, at least three other cases that i know of that have become very public um but each one of those cases was a little different than ramon san pedro because they were able to do it themselves mm. uh, since the new euthanasia law only happened about two months ago I do not know, nothing yet has been made public of its effects. Um, so no, uh, asking the government now for it, I don't know yet of its effects. But I know that there are cases beforehand that people have done it um, in order to protest the law. And they, are, they all did do it on video. They, they film themselves. And the reason why they film themselves, it's kind of uh, interesting, is because they want to show that nobody's around them, thus nobody should be prosecuted, that it wasn't somebody that fed them something, but rather they had the drink themselves or the uh, poison they procured it themselves. And in the video, when they inject themselves or they drink something, they very clearly specify that nobody was there to help them and this was their own will. That's fascinating. Yeah. Anyway, what do you what what do you all think about this? Um, is euthanasia something scary, or is this something that should be given as a right for those that have a will for it? You know, there was an Israeli film that came out a couple of years ago on this subject called I wish I could remember the name of it, but I'll I'll find the name of it. But you know, a lot of these people were elderly. They had dementia, they were sick, they were not getting better. And I'm sure just like San Pedro, I mean, they had no quality of life. So I think it's hard for us, it's hard for an individual to say, is it right or is it wrong for somebody else? 
Exactly. And I guess that is really my point that I wanted to make with this presentation is that it doesn't matter that I want to live. It doesn't matter that all the films, all the protagonists just jump through fire and explosions and whatever, just so they can survive and live. That doesn't really matter, right? What matters is the individual and their choice and our respect for them as an individual, rather than what do I think? Do I want to die? Or thus they should not or they should, right? Good. Anybody else? What else do you think uh, about the topic? Do you have any questions about the presentation or the film in general uh, or the situation in Spain that uh, I can address? In terms of uh, politics, how did, um, like Spain's like a vast majority of like Catholic country. I imagine they have like a solid wing of political parties that are re super religious or at least religious. How did that play into the, into it? So let me read to you actually something just specifically on this. Um, the political right, which is um, nowadays it's represented by this party called Vox uh, and also Pepe, Partido Popular, uh, opposed this vehemently. Um, uh, and let me find this little quote because I was just reading this. It says, the Catholic Church and the medical establishment condemned the fact of the assisted suicide of San Pedro. In some mass media, on the radio, we could listen to disabled people speaking about their love of life. They expressed their lack of understanding for San Pedro's choice. So, no, it is not accepted by the um, generally Catholic faith, which is, the Catholic faith has a very specific and special role in Spanish society. The constitution does make uh, the case for a separation of state and religious organization uh, of that power. However, the Catholics have a lot of influence uh, in Spain. Um, and yes, they did not agree uh, with this law, nor with um, San Pedro's uh, suicide, right? To them, it is a sin, life is sacred, and one should preserve it, right? In the film, we have that whole conversation with the uh, um, religious, represent uh, religious representative, uh, and we can see that play out to some extent. Um, yeah, very good, thank you. Um, I have a question. So obviously, you know, during in 98 and then when the movie came out, it kind of spurred interest in the subject. Is it still a very polarizing subject today? And like kind of how does that level of debate compare to what we see in the United States? So, um, yes, it is still polarizing uh, by the majority of parliamentaries, which are like our Congress. Um, they decide to vote on it and, and accept uh, the, the law and put it into law. So they've changed the penal code, they've added a new law. Uh, the law was received and signed by the king of Spain um, and it's put into law. Yes, it's still polarizing, but not, um, yeah, it's, it's on both sides. But, but it got accepted in the end. So, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, like in the United States, we'll have people, you know, doing crazy things and going in the streets and reclaiming their rights or calling for their rights and some people against them. But in the end, the, Spain is one of the very few countries in Europe that allows it. I believe they're the third or the fourth country uh, that allows for, that has a law for euthanasia. Good, thank you. Um, I had a question. So uh, you mentioned that there are some certain diseases that um, are debilitating enough to accept euthanasia. Are there any exceptions or do you know like the specific diseases that are in this law? The law does not make, uh, sp is not specific on um, which diseases are afforded uh, this. Um, the law says that you have to be in an excruciating and incurable condition on one level and then on the other they also say that it is psychologically torturous to continue living so they they leave it quite vague and rather broad in order to allow for a case like san pedro which was not in any physical exceptional pain in fact he was quite healthy um, as an individual, and while he couldn't move and do much, um, 
you know, and, and think about it. He was a, an exceptional member of society. He wrote two books. He appeared on TV. He was famous. He had all these ladies fall in love with him. And yet he still wanted to die, which is so contradicting. You think that what else does one want in life, right? But he, he wanted to. And, you know, that is a decision that in a way we should uphold and respect, even though we may not understand it. It doesn't make any sense to me, right? But it's not about me. Good, thank you, Maddie. Go ahead. So the state of Oregon allowed a case of euthanasia a few years ago, and that may be state law, but what about federal law? Do you think the U.S. will change? I cannot foretell the future, but um, I would say that most often um, laws will favor granting of rights more than um, prohibiting rights. And if the conversation is put forth in such a way that this is an essential human right and the media plays it as such and other cases appear that are very important, let's say an old president of the country or um, something like that, then yes, it is possible that we would also accept it. In, in the U.S., we have we have right, I believe, right of passing laws where, right, we can pull the plug, right? The person is brain dead or something, or they're in a coma. The family does have the right to end that patient's life. So we're somewhere in between. We're not quite fully uh, on like the Oregon case or like in Spain it is now, but we're not either to that point where we will do nothing to end the person's life. What I find most interesting is that a lot of countries, <clears throat> well, let's, let's not generalize, but that some countries like Spain that allows for the death penalty would not allow euthanasia. <laughs> it's like, okay, we're willing to shoot these people or whatever, poison them, whatever it may be the, the course of death, but not allow somebody who is in their full, with their full faculties to commit suicide in a way that is assisted because they don't have use of their arms or legs or they're too sick or something like that. So yes, to answer your question, I think that in time, it's very possible. I think it's more possible than not. That's how I would go with that, but I don't know when or how. Thank you for that question. Thank you for the answer. Anybody else? <clears throat> Aaron says, should the law be exclusive only for those who are suffering? Um, at the moment, yes. Uh, in Spain, it is only for those who are suffering. And I believe you have to also be, I think there is an age restriction. It is not for every depressed person, right? You're going through depression and you're like, that's it. I need assisted suicide. Like, I don't, it doesn't work like that. It is very careful. Uh, about that. So it is not available to everyone, um, but th those cases have to be judged um, by doctors and other um, things like that and approved before they are made available. <clears throat> Lynn says, what about mental suffering? Yes, the law in Spain is specific that um, mental torture of continuing to be alive, psychological distress to that level is a cause for this. Um, but again, you have to still be approved. It is not um, you just show up at the dispensary and you buy your <laughs> weed or whatever, right? It's not, it's not like that. It is quite, more, quite a bit more complex. Very good. Thank you for your questions. Well, if there are no more questions, um, I thank you again, Constantine, for being with us. And I thank all of you for joining us this evening. And if you haven't had a chance to watch the movie, please do.